90% of people who I talk to should not eat intuitively. With regards to fat loss, it's not intuitive for a lot of people. You can't starve yourself to success. If it was easy and intuitive, everyone would do it. And it's so vague to the point where you don't even know where to start. Dr. Kevin Stock. Dr. Kevin Stock. Kevin Stock. Dr. Kevin Stock. A strict carnivore, a national level physique competitor. He's a dentist. Inventor of an intranasal device designed to help with snoring and sleep apnea. And a uh, ripped ass guy. I do think one of the biggest benefits is it heals the relationship with food. And a lot of these cravings and carb addictions where you can walk by the sugar aisle. There's actually studies that show people that just weigh themselves every day will lose weight because it brings an awareness to it. What, you gained 30 pounds eating a car? How did you do that? Honey has been a gateway drug. That's not really your body saying that, that's your brain. Because your body is saying, I'm actually having inflammation, I'm having acne, I'm having digestive issues. You hear, eat until you're comfortably full. Or listen to your body. Eat intuitively. Shouldn't I just eat what I like? I want to eat more sugar intuitively. That tastes delicious. That can easily steer you in the wrong way. Once you start eating real food over time and actually get healthy, there is a more intuitive yep. sense around food. But most of it are probably years away from that. In today's episode, Dr. Kevin Stock and I talk about some of the cons to intuitively eating and how to boost one's metabolism to then see weight loss. And throughout this video, we use some words and terminology that some people may not be as familiar with. So I'm just gonna cover some of these basic terms just so everyone can kind of understand what he and I are talking about throughout this video. You've probably heard of the words bulk and cut within the bodybuilding space. And so essentially, whenever we're referring to a cut, we're talking about pulling back on calories eating less food, cutting down on weight, and seeing more weight loss. So we kind of use the word cut synonymous with weight loss. And then with bulk, bulking would be the opposite. We're eating more food, we're getting bigger, we're bulking, we're boosting our metabolism. And we also use the word reverse diet, which is very similar to bulking. A reverse diet is the opposite of a diet. When someone's trying to lose weight, they go in diet mode. So they are taking what they currently eat and they're eating less to then see weight loss, right? They're doing a cut. But oftentimes what ends up happening is once someone has lost their weight or if they've stayed in this cut phase for a long period of time, then their metabolism slows down, their body adapts to having this amount of food that someone may start seeing a weight loss plateau or if the person has already lost all of the weight that they wanted to lose, they're still eating this smaller amount of food. So how do we get out of that? Well, we have to do what's called more of a reverse diet, eat more food, bulk, to then be eating more of a healthier amount of calories and food to help with our hormones, our metabolism, our thyroid function. We're not supposed to be in diet mode all of the time. I work with a lot of clients specifically for weight loss and contrary to what people would think, oftentimes, initially, I will give the person more food. We'll go through a bulk reverse diet because a lot of people who I see initially are already eating a smaller amount of food that the only way that this person's gonna lose weight is to eat even less. Let's say hypothetically, someone's eating 1500 calories to lose weight, eat 1200 calories. But then what happens once the metabolism slows down, basal metabolic rate drops, the person then hits a weight loss plateau. The only way they're gonna then lose weight is to eat even less. Now they're at 800 calories. Eventually again, the basal metabolic rate will drop, metabolism slow down, the person hits a weight loss plateau, the body adapts to eating 800 calories, that then this person has to eat 500 calories to lose weight, and then zero calories to lose weight. And so this is where I take people through reverse dieting, slowly increasing their food intake, so that way they can eat a healthy amount of food where they're able to get all the vitamins and minerals, protein, all the nutrients they need, that helps with their thyroid function, their hormones, metabolism, their mood, their sleep, their energy. So we do want to make sure we're eating enough and that we're not in diet mode forever. This is one of the reasons why I think listening to your body can be challenging when someone's trying to lose weight because who knows how to intuitively eat for weight loss, you know? So I left links in the description to Dr. Kevin Stock's social media handles. And if you enjoyed today's conversation, make sure to give the video a thumbs up. The first question I want to start with is, have you ever given bad advice on the internet or something that you wish you didn't say or said differently? One of my biggest fears is dementia, but then my other one is giving advice and then people taking it and it not working or they actually hurt themselves with my advice. So I do have fears around that, but I try my best to like dot my I's, cross my T's and make sure that I'm communicating in the best way possible without people misinterpreting what I'm saying. So, and you may not know this, is I've actually been posting stuff online for a long time. I started 
with more just fitness education starting like my second year of dental school. So that is, I don't even know, that's 15, I'm not gonna do the math right now, a long time ago. So, and I, so I actually created two programs. One was like a bulking program, one was like a, a cutting program, and they worked, and they do work, but if I was to recreate those programs today, they would, they would be a lot different. I think, and it's, it's true for like me, but I think a lot of people is, or the goal is like you just keep learning over time. So you wanna give the best advice you can based on your experience and your knowledge at a certain time, but you know, that should evolve and grow over time. It'd be great if we knew everything from the onset, but yeah. yeah so I would say that, and then with regard to more of the carnivore space in the last seven years, there's one thing in particular that I, I would say I changed my mind on where I used to think everyone should just dive in and be like, all right, pull the bandaid off. Don't like tiptoe into cold water, go through the adaptation symptoms, kill the cravings as fast as possible and just go all in where now I think it's, there's still a lot of kind of like type A people that are better off just like, Hey, when I'm going all in, I'm going all in. And that works for them. But I do think a lot of people, and maybe it's half, I don't know, like the ratio of where it's like, hey, let's get rid of the worst foods and then let's add in the best foods and slowly get to, if we're ever gonna even do a pure carnivore diet, which I think is a good idea for a lot of people to do for a period of time. And maybe uh, most people not forever, uh, but that gradual approach works for a lot of people. So I recommend that a lot more now. So that, I would say that's the biggest thing that I've changed in the last seven years or so. So you said get rid of the worst foods and incorporate the best, you know, better foods. Mm -hmm. What would be those worst foods? So generally it'd be, if I was going to give like this most simple advice, I would say, all right, let's just cut out anything with vegetable seed oils and added sugars like high fructose corn syrup. And let's add red meat to two out of three meals and make that like the foundation of your meals. Mm -hmm. And so if you do just those two things, pretty simple steps, that'll take your diet like very, very far. Uh, but you'll quickly realize, like, if you get rid of a lot of the seed oils and the sugars, you're like, oh, that's half my pantry. So that, that is the one thing is uh, yeah. you, you quickly get to realize, like, these things aren't everything. And But I think that's a very useful piece of information. It like, starts steering people on the right track. So I don't know if I would consider this bad advice. It's just advice that worked for certain people and then for other people. Like for myself, it didn't really work. But when, especially moving into more of a carnivore or just low-carb or healthier diet, you hear eat until you're comfortably full mm -hmm. or listen to your body, eat intuitively. So even if you're not even in the carnivory space, I've just seen other people in like a standard American diet kind of space saying like, I eat intuitively. Mm -hmm. I don't find that that really works for a lot of people. Um, I don't know if you disagree with that, but I don't know if I, it's kind of like two different conversations. If someone's eating a standard American diet and saying eat intuitively, are you listening to your body? Or are you listening to your brain? Right? Cause my body is saying, hey, you know what? I want chocolate cake. And so exactly. I think that's not really your body saying that that's your brain because your body is saying, I'm actually having inflammation. I'm having acne. I'm not, you know, I'm having digestive issues. So your body doesn't want chocolate cake. Your brain does. But if someone's eating more of like a carnivore diet or a whole foods diet, they still might hear, okay, eat intuitively. But they still, I find in my case, at least a lot of times people under eat. Mm -hmm. I think eat intuitively is a good end goal. So a couple of examples. One is I've been working out in the gym for a long time, 20, over 20 years, mm -hmm. basically daily. And so when I go to work out, I actually, and people are like, what are you doing for your workouts? I'm like, a lot of it is like intuitive mm -hmm. and it's not helpful advice at all for someone. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go in there today. I could, I could explain what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, but it, it would not be relevant to most anyone else mm -hmm. because it is more of an intuitive approach. I don't have like a program that I've written out that I follow that I'm checking off reps and sets or anything like that. And I think eating ideally, can and should turn into that but most people like you said like they think they're eating intuitively and if I, that, like that's a blade that cuts tw uh, two ways like like you said with sugar it's like yeah i want to eat more sugar i'm intuitively like that tastes delicious shouldn't i just eat what i, what I like mm -hmm. and so that can easily steer you in the wrong way uh but then i do think like once you kind of make a turn where like now i'm like if i eat something i'm like i know intuitively that is going to be disagreeable with me mm -hmm. and the last thing that i always thought of when you were talking is depending on one's goals like you said, if someone's like, I want to lose weight <laughs> and you're intuitively eating to your full and that's not getting you to your goal, then maybe you're going to have to adjust some things. So I think there's a few things to consider there. So I'm helping someone right now trying to lose weight and they told me last week, they're like, I just feel like I'm trying to focus so hard on eating vitamins and minerals and more protein. And Lily, I just don't know, like my body's not actually asking for that. It's not, do you think I should really be trying to get more vitamins and minerals and protein? Because I feel like I'm not trusting myself because my body's not saying that it actually wants to have more eggs or it wants to have more protein, specifically protein, but they did say vitamins and minerals. And I was like, yes, you do need vitamins and minerals. <laughs> well, let's put that out there. Yeah. But like, how 
do you like she feels like she's not trusting her body now because she's like more listening to what I'm saying when I'm saying hey you gotta eat this and she feels like she's going against what her body is telling her which is like I just want to eat light hmm I like to intuitively know I need more calcium I need more vitamin C I need some vitamin E like I don't think anyone has that level yeah. of intuition so yeah having got your guidance I think is probably a good idea there uh, but with regards to fat loss and like intuitive like it's not intuitive for a lot of people and so yeah that's one thing I mean that's why there's coaches and books and all these things if it was easy and intuitive like everyone would do it mm -hmm. uh, so yeah well and that's that's the argument too that is this person at their goals because if they if they've reached their goals if they say I have lots of energy I'm sleeping good I'm at my weight and now I'm eating intuitively and things are going great awesome but if you're telling me you're not reaching your goals and you want to trust your body and listen to your body, then those things don't align because you're not reaching your goals. That's what I see all the time too. So if I was a male who was 47 years old, I'm five foot 10, 200 pounds, I wanna lose 40 pounds, I'm currently eating, let's say 1500 calories a day. Mm. What would be your advice for me to now lose weight? What kind of diet are they currently eating? Standard American. So this is the kind of person who tends to have a lot of success. It, well, 1,500 calories is really low. So have they been like restrictive eating for a long time? Yeah, for, they never track, don't care, never. So they just naturally don't eat a lot of food and they're overweight? Yep. Okay, so this is the kind of person where we easily, like the advice I gave earlier, get rid of the, those two worst foods, let's start eating a lot of red meat. And then the next biggest thing, would we're going to be going to the gym. And I'm actually going to treat this almost like a bulk, being like, you're not going to try and count calories or anything. You're going to eat at least this much meat every day, but we're also going to get in the gym. And I would... How much meat? So that's a good thing. I, early on, we'd just be like, just eat till you're satisfied. We, I would actually probably gradually ramp that up too. Gradually reduce the bad foods, increase the meat over time, and increase his effort in the gym. And his muscle mass should go up, especially, I mean, if he's eating a uh, standard American diet and he's moving to a heavy meat-based diet, getting lots of protein and resistance training, we will ramp his metabolism up, build mu lean muscle mass, put him in a place where if and when he does need to actually do a cut, we can actually have success. Why do you care about building his metabolism? Well, I'm, I don't have to tell you, but uh, if he's eating 1,500 calories a day and he's 40 pounds overweight, you said? Sure. Though, I mean, really, you have to eat less than that. And so you're soon going to fall, like, you're not going to be able to starve yourself to, like, like I say, you can't starve yourself to success. So he could lose weight. He could eat less yep. and he could do more cardio and he could have some temporary weight loss, like eat 1,200 calories and start doing an hour of cardio a day, he's going to be feeling absolutely horrible in no time. He might lose five pounds, but then like, there's no, there's nowhere you can go from there. Mm -hmm. You can eat 500 calories and do more cardio. But before you know it, like you're not eating food, you're doing hours and hours of cardio and you're not anywhere near your body composition. Nonetheless, being able to maintain that body composition, even if he did get it. So you get to see like, okay, that's not a path that you can sustainably get to your goals whatsoever. So you have to get those, that food consumption up way more than five, 10, 200 pounds, like, he, yeah, he needs to be eating 2,500, 3,000 calories to even begin thinking of that, like, the cut phase, <laughs> before the cut phase takes place. Yep. I just had a client today who I told her, I said, you get two options. Option one, we can cut your calories that are at 1,100 right now to lose weight, or we can slowly boost it up, get to a healthy amount of calories, because if we take that 1,100, we can drop it down to eight, 700 calories, but eventually you're going to have to come out of that. Yep. So you can do it now, we can do it later, but you're not going to be able to sustain 700 calories because what happens once you lose the weight? What are you going to do? Exactly. I mean, and this is, this is standard kind of like bodybuilding stuff. And like, I'm kind of doing it right now where you have these seasons where you're really focused on eating more calories, building up a metabolism, putting on lean body mass. Mm -hmm. And then you also put on body fat during that time. Like I'm up 30 pounds right now in the last 16 months. And my, I think I'm up 20 pounds of fat. And according to in body scans, like 10 pounds of muscle, which I am thrilled about actually. So I will soon then do a cut, lose some of that body fat. But the idea is after that cut, my caloric consumption and body composition is beyond what it was when we started. So you kind of mm -hmm. go to this bulk cut, bulk cut, bulk cut. So over time, your metabolism actually keeps building over time. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the goal. And you can get better and better and it becomes easier and easier too. Cause like, it's a lot easier to lose fat eating 3,000 calories if you're eating 5,000 versus someone eating like starving themselves on 1,200 calories. Right. So how many, you've worked with clients, you've done coaching. So do you think that there's a certain percentage of people who you find eating intuitively 
doesn't work for initially. Like for me, if I had to put a number on it, I'd be like 90% of people who I talk to should not eat intuitively because they're just going to under eat. Like so many people have chronically dieted for so many years. They don't know what full feels like. They don't know what they're supposed, you know, what a, a real amount of food to be eating is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And intuitively is so vague to the point where it's not very helpful for most people. Like, well, I, they don't, that, you don't even know where to start. Like intuitively, like what does that mean? I'm hungry. I'm gonna go eat food. Like that's just like the probably the limit of an intuition most people have. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I do think once you start eating real food over time and actually getting healthy, there is a more intuition yep. sense around food. But most people are, are probably years away from that. And one thing actually, uh, just to like plug a carnivore diet, like all meat based diet is I do think one of the biggest benefits is it heals the relationship with food. Like mm -hmm. a lot of these like cravings and carb addictions where you can walk by the sugar aisle or whatever and you're not like, oh, I need to eat X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. That is a big step in the direction of intuitive eating. But yeah, so that's why I'm a big advocate of like getting rid of those foods for a period of time. And if and when in reintroducing certain foods, like the right ones mm -hmm. where you can develop this level of intuitive eating. Because I do think that a lot of people, that's a goal. It's like, hey, I'd like to just like not count calories and track everything. Mm -hmm. I would like to just be able to intuitively eat. But like there is a little bit of a, a road to get to that. I intuitively eat nowadays. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to throw that out there for people like, what? This is all like a lie or I'm not supposed to intuitively eat. I'm going to be misled and I can't trust my body. But, you know, I get again, I think it comes down to people's hormones are maybe imbalanced for a long period of time or their hunger signals. They're just they don't know what it feels like to be satisfied and full and to get all the micronutrients that they need. So you also, like you said, you are building muscle right now or you're trying to bulk. So you can't intuitively eat right now or you know how to intuitively eat to build. I think I know. So I've done this for a long time. And so I do kind of intuitively know when I'm eating more in a surplus, mm -hmm. even though, so I was tracking very early in this to be like, all right, where am I at? I like to get all my baseline numbers. And after a couple months, I just, I stopped <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I'm going to eat a little bit more over time. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, that's the kind of the same thing I'm doing in the gym. Like I'm going to push myself, you know, move the weights up, increase the volume a little bit over time. Uh, so I am more intuitively doing it right now. And I, you know, I weigh myself every day. So it's like a very rough check-in and I'm doing in-body scans. Now I'm doing it more frequently once a week, but so uh, yeah, it's intuitively, but I'm also checking the numbers at the same time. So, but it's not like religious. Um, I feel like sometimes too, people think it becomes now too complicated. We're like, what tracking and macros and calories and numbers and I don't even know how to start. Mm -hmm. So what would just be like your rough idea of like, you know, if you eat this, you're probably covered or is that not a thing? Cause everyone's so different. Most people like if they're trying to like bulk or cut, I would, I would actually just have them track their food. Because of trying to be like, let's just ballpark it. I think ballparking it is fine when it comes to tracking your macros. Oh. So I'm like, hey, let's track your macros. But if you're if there's air, don't don't sweat it. That's where I say ball because trying to explain intuition around, hey, we're gonna eat a little bit more over time. Especially from a coach's perspective, you like you don't really have any insight in at that point. You're like, yeah. oh, you've been intuitive e eating. Tell me about how it's gone. Well, yeah. I have no idea. I don't have any records or anything like that. So it's hard from a coaching perspective. And so I would probably just lay out someone's like, hey, let's let's shoot for these macros for you. And we're trying, like, this is where you are. This is where you want to go. These are the macros we're going to start. This is how we're going to move the macros over time. This is what we're going to do in the gym. And that's, that's how I would approach it. So when you're bulking and you're gaining 30 pounds, was that 30 pounds, right? It's over 30 pounds now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so was it, are you still doing more of a carnivore, strict carnivore approach or how did you gain so much weight? Cause I think a lot of people think what you gained 30 pounds eating uh, a carnivore diet. How did you do that? So I've, during the carnivore diet, I've done bulks and cuts. Uh, so, but this is the longest one. And there's a, a lot to this. So it goes back to my gym shut down in 2020. So for two years, I was doing home workouts mm -hmm. at home and I was intuitively just eating steak and I lost a lot of weight. I was going through the motions at, and just home workouts. So I did lose a lot of weight. Uh, so a Not lot- you didn't want to lose. That, no, I was, I was going through the, exactly. It wasn't like, and so I hit a low weight and I'm like, you know what? I need to do a, one of my old classic bulks. Um, and so I was gonna do same meat, eggs, and I added in raw milk. So some dairy for the first time. And I, in my history, I don't have a history of much dairy at all. So I didn't, I didn't think I was gonna actually, dairy was gonna agree with me at all. Cause I just don't have any history eating it, but I've been doing raw dairy and it has been fantastic. And now I drink a lot of that. That has really helped me probably more so than anything else in the realm of the bulk. And I don't wanna say I couldn't have done that without the milk. Like I could have just keep eating more and more meat and eggs, but 
I think the milk has made it more like easy and enjoyable. I actually, I, I love the raw milk now. So um, yeah, th that's probably been the biggest factor. I feel like people who have tried raw milk, they're like team raw milk. Like I love raw milk, but then there's other people who are like, milk is for babies. Colossum is for yeah. babies. Don't do it. Yeah, I actually agree with both camps, meaning I think most people are probably best limiting or eliminating dairy in general. Because most people are like metabolically broken. They don't need extra lactose. They don't need any, like, for example, Asians, like 80% of Asians are lactose intolerant. Mm. And they can, if you do raw milk, it's better than like pasteurized. But even then, a lot of people are just better off not in including dairy. But some people that seem to do fine with it, it's super rich in nutrition. It is calorically dense and if someone's trying to gain weight it's a fantastic tool like like in the bodybuilding realm of putting on good weight um, but it can also help put on bad weight too like i put on 20 pounds of fat probably so and a lot of people would be that would be a non-starter so it, it, it cuts both ways i think it is like a superfood as far as nutrition but for the people that can really tolerate it and it is appropriate for their goals like metabolically healthy trying to gain weight versus someone that's overweight metabolic dysfunction i might be like yeah you maybe you have some if you can moderate it, but, and you tolerate it, but yeah, I would, it's kind of like fruit in that regard, like healthy food, you know, for, if you're having about the healthier act and you can tolerate it and everything like mm -hmm. that. But uh, if you got diabetes and you're trying to lose a lot of weight, I, I wouldn't eat tons of fruit. So I, I, it's kind of almost in the same realm. I'd rather bulk on raw milk than I would on fruit though. But we can go into that discussion. But. I would love to go into that discussion. Cause I just talked to Paul Saladino like a couple days ago. He was like, if you have diabetes, have fruit, it's not going to make you more diabetic. I can agree to an extent that I don't think people are getting diabetes because they're eating too much fruit. Yeah. I think it's more of the processed foods, but what are your thoughts on fruit, especially because now people are going to hear contradicting ideas, I'm sure. So yeah, well, so fruit, like I agree with what you said, people aren't getting diabetes because they're eating fruit. However, people that are eating a lot of fruit stimulates appetite, keeps that sugar craving alive and a lot, like honey for a lot of people in the carnivore. Like I've worked with a lot of people and it's been like a gateway drug. So mm -hmm. it's like, oh yeah, I had honey, but yeah. I have half a jar of honey and then it turned into, you know, five pieces of fruit with every meal and fruit juice and they're on like an all fruit diet and they're like, I'm not getting results. I'm not losing weight. I'm like, you're, yeah, you're a high carb, high sugar diet. <laughs> so that's what I think about fruit. Like what I was talking about, I wouldn't use it as like a muscle gaining tool is I would personally rather have a glucose based carbohydrate than a fructose based carbohydrate when it comes to muscle building. And that's totally counterintuitive, intuitive, but in the context of insulin and bulking and muscle building, we want that higher insulin spike, if you will, with a glucose-based carb versus a fructose uh, that has to be converted in the liver. And, it's, and we want to basically the point of the glucose carb is to store muscle glycogen in the muscle. So I would tend to go towards more a, a glucose-based carbohydrate like uh, potato, for example, a root versus a fruit. Do you think that fruit, too much fruit could lead to any sort of fatty liver disease? um could it potentially I, eating whole fruit i doubt it okay. um now if you're like just guzzling fruit juice and super high fructose diet and you're also drinking alcohol and like all these other okay. potentially could, okay. like confounding things i mean fruit is high in fiber and so it's very hard to just eat a ton of it. It just eat a ton. Exactly. Yeah. You just feel terrible. So that's where intuitive eating comes in. You're like, yeah, I'm sick to my stomach. I have gas all the time. I'm bloated. It's like, that's intuitive. Like you're just eating way too much fiber fruit, you know? So it probably could, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be my first thing to be like, oh, you're going to have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because you're eating too much fruit. Mm -hmm. um, but in the context of someone already being kind of metabolically broken and then eating lots of fruit, it's not going to help their situation. Right. So I eat fruit, yeah. but I eat like a piece of fruit and I'm not opposed to having more than a piece of fruit. And especially cause I'm someone who's active, I'm going to use the fuel. Yep. Um, but with the fruit, like we go to the same, I'm sure similar grocery stores where the fruit's more like moldy, rotten, old shit from out of countries. It's just doesn't look very good. So I was thinking that if we're going to increase carbs, we want to do it with more of the dairy, but I don't know. Do you have a, well, you are, you're doing it with dairy right now too. Yeah. And to me, trying to like from the context of bulking put on muscle through fruit like i was just saying you have to eat so much i, I it would be hard to eat that much fruit to get that much carbohydrate and then also eat a lot of meat that that you want to eat as well mm. i i just don't think it's ideal from a bodybuilding perspective necessarily nor necessarily a health perspective there's an interesting kind of uh this is like kind of current topics that i'm not sure i totally agree with people i really respect are like hey 
it sounds like you're low carb. Like, like if you have a fruit, like one or two pieces of fruit here, you're having less than 100 grams of carbs a day. Some people are like, you're kind of in low carb purgatory where you're not in ketosis, but you're not having enough carbohydrate yeah, yeah. for fuel. And I don't agree with that. I think it's actually a, the idea is metabolic flexibility where, hey, you actually are like fat metabolism. You're sleeping that fasting period. You have meals without carbohydrates. So you're actually running on fat, but then you have some carbohydrate and you can switch to a carbohydrate carbohydrate metabolism efficiently. I think that's actually the goal, that metabolic flexibility. But then other people I said that, like Amber O'Hearn, I respect her tremendously, is like the two who said, hey, if you're having some carbohydrate consistently, you're not getting the benefits of ketosis and you're not having the benefits of high carb. And I don't, I don't agree with that from personal experience as I, I just don't think that's, that's true. I actually think the goal is that metabolic flexibility. I think humans are meant to not eat large amounts of carbohydrates, but we can tolerate some carbohydrates. So that having that flexibility, I think is important. Just like how it's very common for people to under eat, a lot of people also are under eating on vitamins and minerals, specifically potassium and magnesium. 98% of people are low in potassium and 75% of people have been reported to be low in magnesium. And these minerals are really important for heart regulation, nerve function, and hydration. One of the easiest ways I get more of these minerals into my diet is by taking a drink mix called Element. It's a packet that I just put into my water and milk each day and it gives me more sodium, magnesium, and potassium. Element is a really clean ingredient brand for electrolytes with no sugar or artificial ingredients. You can use the link in the description to get eight additional free packets of Element with any order, or you can get those eight additional free packets of Element by going to the URL drinkelement.com slash lilycane, and Element does have a money back guarantee, so if you try it and you don't like it, you can get your money back. What are you doing for, are you trying to, are you doing like bulks and cuts? Are you not, are you in maintenance? Cause I always think like maintenance is the ground to like slowly not maintenance. If you know what I mean? If you're, if you're not getting better, you're like, uh, you're, you know, I just find maintenance very hard. Like that's what I was doing during COVID more or less during home workouts, maintenance. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, like mm -hmm. maintenance, I lost a lot of weight. So now I'm like, consciously like all right i'm gonna i'm gonna do a bulk for 18 months i'm gonna do a cut for that and it's like okay i'm back to getting progress again no i'm definitely in maintenance but like you say my maintenance slowly turns into now i'm under eating again <laughs> so i have to check like maybe every three months every four months just put it in a chronometer see okay where am i at and i think like again tracking sounds like a lot of work for people and i do not track every day i have no like that does not sound fun to me i don't have the time for that but if you track one time you know randomly and you're like wow so that's what i've been doing recently now i do granted eat very similarly mm -hmm. so it's pretty easy for me to be like oh okay i had one less egg today so i know i'm eating a little bit less but for most people they're eating you know mexican food and then pasta and then salads and so that's all so different each day is going to be so different if they track one day they might say wow great i'm eating you know over 2,000 calories i'm doing good but then they don't realize that you know six of the other days of the week they're doing a thousand i think one of the best things about tracking is if you start, if you eat like a very complicated pasta dish, you're like, how do I track this? I got noodles, I got sauce, I got all this other stuff. It makes you want to eat like single ingredient foods. Cause you're like, oh, I can track that. <laughs> I think that's a, a big benefit of, tra of tracking. Like, uh, and I think th there's actually studies that show like people that literally that just weigh themselves every day will lose weight because it brings an awareness to it. I, I bet you it's true with tracking as well. Like don't, you don't try and like loot, like eat less calories, but if you just track your food, food or whatever, it brings an awareness to what you're eating and people just will naturally improve what they eat just simply by doing that. Wow. But like you said, a lot of people don't like to track. I don't personally like to track, but I do think it's a useful tool. Yeah, so I'm in maintenance mode right now. You're in maintenance. But, I, well, I say that, but during the winter, I try to bulk. Yeah. Which is like not really happening right now, so thanks for reminding me. <laughs> um, but then in the summer, I like to, hey, it's summertime, let's cut right. a little bit. Right. That's how I like to do it generally. Yeah. I like to uh, start a cut in the spring, maybe late winter, three months maybe, and then reverse diet. And then you bulk basically for nine months, cut for three months or something like that. And that way it's like you spend most of your time like trying to put on muscle and then you spend a short amount of time cutting that fat off. And that way you're always moving in that or that upper right, you know, up into the right direction. Well, in the wintertime, I need a little bit more fat on me to keep me warm. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But you said the word reverse diet. Yeah. So for people, if they're like, what is this reverse diet? Could you explain, like, how do you approach that? Yeah, so re reverse diet would be like, okay, so I'm bulking. I say, I'm just going to use some simple numbers. My calories are at 3,500. 
Is that actually where your calories are? Right it's now? roughly around 3,500. Okay, Paul's about 3,500. He's pretty late. I'm like, he what? Is... You're 3,500? I was shocked. But He's that's great. So lean. That means he has great metabolism. I talked to him about this and I said, Paul, have you always been lean? Have you ever like gained weight? Yeah. And he's always been very lean. So as someone like a fat kid at heart, I've had to deal with the body composition stuff. Like that's what got me into this in the first place, like decades ago. Uh, but you know, I've learned a lot having to like figure out my own body composition, how to gain weight, how to lose weight, all that. Uh, but reverse dieting. So if I'm at 3,500 calories, cause I gradually built up, I was probably eating 2,500 calories and I wanted to put on weight. So I gradually moved it up to, th we'll call it 3,500 calories slowly over the last 16 months, which I'll probably do another two months. So 18 months. So we're at 35, it might be a little bit higher than that, but we're going to use round numbers. I will gradually cut probably back down to 2,500. Maybe if, depending on how lean, maybe it'll get down to 2,000 over the course of We'll call it three months. And then I will gradually go back up again. So we hit 2000, we'll just say that's a low. I doubt it'll, it'll get that low, but then I'll go gradually get back up to maintenance, which my maintenance is now probably higher than it was. So if it was 2,500, my maintenance is, hopefully I have more lean body mass, higher metabolic rate, maybe it's at 2,700, 2,800 calories. So I'll go back up to that. I'll be at maintenance. If I just stay there, my body composition would stay flat, but then I'll just keep going up. So it's like the reverse diet is really just a bulk starting from that, that diet low, but you just gradually do it. You don't, I don't jump right back from 2000 to 3000 calories. Okay. That's a good way to put a lot of fat on real fast. Right. So that's the thing is people listening. I don't think they're eating as much as we're eating probably right now. So if they're eating like, let's call it 1400 yeah. then they would reverse diet slowly increase to get up to, you know, at least 2000 for most people, if not more for especially men, taller men, people who are active. Um, and then once they, I do it very gradually. Maybe you have pushback on what I say, but I say, we're just going to do like 50 calories for two weeks and then do another 50. Cause I don't want people coming to me and go, Lily, I gained weight. Right. Cause if I do it slow enough, they're not going to gain weight. But oftentimes people are like, Lily, I don't have time to go from my 1400 calories to 1450 for two weeks to then 1500 for two weeks to then 1550 for two weeks. Cause that takes six, seven, eight months yeah. to get up to a normal amount of calories to then drop it down to lose weight. So they're like, Lily, you know what? I'm just going to go from that 1400 to my, you know, let's call it 2400 for the person. Then they do that. They're like, I only gained a pound. I'm like surprised how many people come to me and they only gained one or two pounds because for so long they were under eating mm -hmm. that now when they eat more, their body's like soaking it up. Yeah. So the 50 calories, I think it's totally fine. I just think that's such a small amount <laughs> yeah. that I'm already telling someone we're ballparking. Like, I'm like, all right, you're rough. You're at 1400 ballpark that now ballpark it to 15 to 1600. Okay. So you do like at least a hundred because 50 calories is so little like that. You, I mean, it's going to take forever. And like you have to really be very accurate. Well, just say, be, add an egg. The, the standard deviation every day <laughs> yeah. is like, so I'm less, I, I'm, I, I'd be more loose with it than that personally. And do people gain weight though? It, yeah. I mean, you start eating where you're going to generally gain weight. But like you said, like early on during a reverse diet, a lot of people will continue to lose weight mm -hmm. and it's, it's counterintuitive because you start eating more. But what can happen is during that cut, it's kind of like a stressor on the body, like a starvation response. Mm -hmm. So you're losing weight, but the body's almost like, uh, it's like the stress. So you start increasing calories again, the body kind of releases its grip. Mm -hmm some inflammation decreases and so the body will loosen up so you, a lot of times like you get the metabolism going again and so people can see weight loss and if your maintenance is still up here and you're still down here even though you're increasing calories you're still below like the body's maintenance mm -hmm. in a sense so uh you so during that reverse diet phase a lot of people continue to lose weight so and are you only increasing healthy foods right you don't want to ever increase bad foods <laughs> yeah yeah and I learned this the hard way. It's this classic in bodybuilding, which I didn't know. The first competition I did, I dieted down and I got super lean. And after it, I was like, of course, I just spent the last 12 weeks like it's uh, like uh, starving yourself in a very structured way. Uh, I was like, oh, I'm going to have like a snack or whatever, you know, like ice cream, whatever it was. And it's like the floodgates open where it's like you have like insatiable appetite for like like it's like the floodgates open you just you you eat your stomach is hurting you can't possibly put another thing in there but you just want to keep eating like the, the brain's not satiated so a diet is not maybe that extreme but a similar effect can happen so it's really important on during the reverse diet that like you said it's like you do it with the proper foods and you actually don't just let the floodgates burst open uh so it's like mentally it's a, it, like that's where the bodybuilding from a mental standpoint is definitely not healthy with food because we take that to the extreme but mm -hmm. even during a diet like we're talking about is like 
there's some degree of that. So it is important, like you said, with, when you reverse diet, like you're not just letting the floodgates open and say, ah, oh, the diet's done. I'm going to start just eating everything I want. You know, you're, I'm really thinking about people watching right now. And they're probably like, what you're saying is so complicated, right? But to me and to you, it's pro it's not <laughs> complicated at all. I'm probably making it too complicated. But, but it's kind of like brushing your teeth, right? Like initially probably a child is like, wow, brushing my teeth is hard, tying my shoes is hard, but then eventually it's, you don't even think about it. Yep. And so similarly, when people maybe are, they're, you know, really low calorie right now and they're like, I have to eat more. Like that seems like I'm going against what my body is telling me. It seems like I have to put all this effort into eating more and you do have to be intentional about it. And, you know, you might have to split up your meals. That's yep. something that I had to do to get more calories in. Um, and so yeah, I can just imagine someone thinking like, this sounds so complicated, but it really isn't. And it shouldn't be after you kind of like get used to it and get the rhythm of it. I agree. I mean, I'm probably making it way more complicated and I could make it even more complicated if people <laughs> wanted, uh, cause there's other strategies you can do, but like you said, it, it doesn't have to be that complicated. Like literally what I'm talking about from like the body composition standpoint is you just eat a little bit more over time and, but you do resistance training during that too. To me, that's What if they important. don't want to work out? <laughs> I, I think, so someone that's like has metabolic damage, right? The medicine is the gym, okay? So it's like, you did the damage, we have to reverse that. How are we gonna reverse that? And the gym and the diet is how we reverse that, but the gym is part of it. Like, your muscles are, <laughs> are resistant, insulin resistant, and it's because like you have an overabundance of energy. It's like, so you put energy in that doesn't want it. So you, anyways, working your muscles is part of the, the medicine that people, I think everyone needs to be doing, uh, but especially people that are met metabolically damaged. So, and it doesn't have to be, that also doesn't have to be complicated or long. Like, so like you can do 15 minutes a day, six days a week and make amazing progress with that. But it's that some of that needs to be in there in my opinion. What does that 15 minutes a day look like? Are they at the gym? Could they do it from home? Does it, is it like, could they do band work? Yeah, so I, that's what I was talking about. It's like, I create a simple program for clients that's 12 minutes a day. It's called the RB12 program. It's literally 12 minutes a day band work program from home. I wanted no one to have an excuse not to work out. And so I was like, anyone can get these bands. It's cheap. Like literally all you have to have is yeah. bands. You can do it at home in 12 minutes a day. Okay, mm -hmm. like there, there's no longer an excuse not to do this. And it's, and you can tailor it. So it's like, it's made for a total beginner. Like, hey, you can do this. But also like, these are kind of like the workouts that I started after, after doing two years at home of resistance bands on all my learnings of that. I put that into this little program where it's like, okay, these are all my learnings from the, this is how you can do it and make it more difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, I obviously was just going through the muscle, uh, the, mo the motions and I lost muscle during that time. So I do like a gym for more advanced, like people that really like, Someone that want to do like bodybuilding competition, I would recommend probably a gym. But for 90% of people, these bands are going to get the job done. My thought with exercise is yes, you don't have to exercise to lose weight. But if your goal for wanting to lose weight is to be healthy, exercise is a part of that equation. Like moving your body is a, is a form of loving yourself. It's a form of health. So it's kind of like who cares if you don't have to exercise to lose weight? You want to be healthy, right? So let's exercise. Yeah. I think a lot of the time... And, and it doesn't have to be like exercise. Like body movement i get in trouble sometimes move. if i say exercise yeah, like exactly. you don't have to go to gym I'm like fine farm garden i don't care move your body i think a lot of times if you ask someone like hey what's your goals and a lot of people have body composition goals like it might be fat loss whatever and they show you a picture this is what i want to look like i'm like okay part of that is going to be like to get you to where you want to go we're, we're going to need to do resistance training and so no i mean you can lose weight without resistance training of course uh, but i think for a lot of people's goals like it needs to be in the equation. Yeah. <laughs> and like you said, from like a health, longevity, just feeling good, staying mobile into old age, all Less these things. Less stress, better sleep, yeah. better for your heart, better for your digestion. I think it's important. Yeah. yeah. Once you're done with your bulk and you're going to cut, are you going to keep doing carnivore? Are you going to do carnivore for life? I've been thinking about this a lot lately. So the way I, <laughs> for a little bit of context, the way I basically walk people through a program is introductory into getting to a meat-based diet. How do we get rid of the worst foods? How do we start eating more of the right foods? Then I like to, I challenge people to do a 90-day carnivore challenge for a whole bunch of reasons. I think it's a good thing for a lot of people to do. Yeah, what are those reasons? Uh, the, we talked about the relationship with food and setting a foundation mm -hmm. which we can reintroduce food if and when they <laughs> are ready. Uh, is I think goes a long way because when we're when we're reintroducing foods, there are a million variables to try and account for. So if we have a very solid baseline mm -hmm. and 
<laughs> we, we can use that foundation to test various foods in and really create a meal plan that's just theirs, like carnivore-ish, whatever, uh, that's unique to them where they can start eating more intuitively <laughs> by using this plan. So we get them into a 90 day carnivore challenge to do the challenge there's like three levels to it the third like 30 days each it just gets more strict as you go oh, okay uh and then after that we're like all right if you reach xyz qualifications let's add let's try in some foods these foods over this period of time uh so like stage one might be any kind of carnivore food fish dairy yep. eggs meat and then you say okay we're removing dairy okay now we're yep. removing eggs and yep. you just go yeah and then... it, yes 30 30 30 is just like that so the, the the first 30 days is the most lenient all animal foods. Second, second one is we're getting rid of the most offending anim, animal foods. So some people do, don't do well with eggs. So we'll take those. Yeah. I'll take dairy out. We can take seafood out. And then the third one is like, we're just going to do ruminant meat for 30 days. And then after that is the, the food reintroduction. So I, this is a long way of explaining that I have actually just kind of did this myself, but then stopped. And, then from the, and I have done some food reintroduction. My first two years of carnivore were um, incredibly strict like it was like a lion diet with never one break like, did you have problems with electrolytes or sleep or testosterone no. or energy or anything no no okay. gi issues for the for a while to the fight didn't no fiber and no carbs so but that was like the the only main issue i cramped up early on so i guess you could say <laughs> electrolyte issues early on but no those those cleared up and i felt fantastic so i didn't see any reason to to change but this is the time after about two years i was getting so many questions about reintroduction of carbs and plant-based foods and can the microbiome take it xyz and i was like so i'd answer these questions from theory <laughs> and i was like i like to be able to answer these questions from experience so mm -hmm. i did some carb experiments i wrote i think this was the end of 2019 and i wrote a very long article that goes through all this if anyone's interested in it uh but then i was like i just went back to carnivore because that's how i i just i was operating great so that this is a long way of saying i've been operating great for, there for a long period of time but i I'm not ready to commit to anything, but maybe more in the hyper carnivore space. Cause that's where I put people, most clients end up, you know, they, they go through the 90 day challenge and then, Hey, all right, we're going to do at least 70% meat based, some 80, 90%, 95%. Uh, but most of them add some flavor <laughs> into their diet somewhere. So I'll probably experiment with that in the future. Again, we'll see. You said hyper carnivore. Yep. Where'd you hear that awesome word, huh? I mean, you are blowing that word up. I love it. So I stopped using it because it was confusing people because they're like hyper made it seem like it was like extra carnivore. Right. And so then I was like, okay, we'll just call it. This is what I eat. No, it's like the textbook definition where it's like, hey, omnivores that specialize in eating meat are hyper carnivores, mm -hmm. which is they tend to eat 70 plus percent of their diet from animal foods. Mm -hmm. And you know, if I had to make an argument for what humans are, I would say we're hyper carnivores. And mm -hmm. there's tons of fossil evidence like, hey, yes, we have eaten plants. We can see it stuck in dental calculus. And we are animal-based predators <laughs> with opportunistic uh, plants of varying kinds based on seasons and locations and time frames and, and such. Something I think that's interesting about both yours and mine is we're kind of eating meat-based, animal-based, carnivore-ish, is that we didn't do it for weight loss. I mean, you didn't do it for weight loss, no. for autoimmune conditions, for gut issues, for skin issues. We just did it because we're like, uh, on paper, it has lots of nutrients and I want to be healthy, so I'm going to do that. Yes, I would say my main reason for doing it is because I had I'd done body composition stuff successfully through, I'll say, more classical bodybuilding techniques, but I felt terrible mentally. Like I was mm. tired all the time and I just didn't have the energy. So well, we're not going to go through the whole backstory, but that I was like, I've done a ketogenic diet before. I'm going to go do keto again. Maybe because everyone's talking about like, you get your ketones up, your brain turns on X, Y, Z. Uh, and so I, I did keto. I was like, all right, I'm really going to do it strict. I'm going to limit my protein, have super high fat. Mm. And I didn't necessarily feel much better, but I definitely, my body composition was going in the wrong direction. So I was like, I'm not, I'm not restricting protein like that again. Uh, and one thing led to another, started re removing plants and then we start eating only meat sometime in mid-2017. So we're going to cook you a steak and we have the option of cooking it in an air fryer and in a cast iron pan. Are you anti-air fryer or what are your thoughts on air fryers? No, I'm not anti-air fryers or cast iron pans. I think people should cook the meat however they like it. <laughs> okay, some people are worried about like chemicals with air fryers and maybe there are a little bit of chemicals, but it's like, you know, I'm taking care of the big things here. I'm sleeping, exercising, getting sun, eating the good foods. And if I have like not perfect 100% cotton clothes, like it's okay. 
Yeah. And I have not done the deep dive research into air fryers. I've, I've never used one, but I know lots of people are using them and lots of people love them. Yeah, like you said, it's, I'm sure it's a, <laughs> it's major in the majors and minor in the minors. And I'm, maybe there is some huge problem and it'll come up on my radar eventually, but I don't know. At this point in time, I'm not aware of like any major problems with air fryers. I'm sure people in the comments will let you know. Where can people follow you on social media and reach out to you? Do you do coaching still or how can people connect with you? So I don't do coaching anymore, but the program, like I was talking about how it's a digital program. People can walk themselves through it. It's at meet.health. And there's all kinds of free resources there too. Like there's a 30 day guide if people are like, just like curious, how do I get into this? The 90 day carnivore challenge is like the full blown program. That's if people really want a deep dive. So that's that. And I'm on all the social media platforms.